just heard that I have only 10 minutes yeah. to give you this speech. It's about nine pages of <laughs> How to do it? Then I don't know if you Make an exception. Another thing is, I, I'm not sure whether my speech will have anything to do with it. With the but anyway, for what it is worth, I will deliver it and you can judge for yourself. The title of my speech is even when you do the right thing, it is still wrong. When I say you, I meant the judges. And why is it still wrong? It's because it's the people who will judge the judges. So I shall start with examples, most of them taken from England, because they have seven years of history, 700 years of history, and they have endured all this. The other day, A friend asked me this question. How is it that some of our judges do not seem to know what is right, what is the right thing to do when all of us know what is right or wrong? I was flabbergasted by the question. It was such a simple question, yet I couldn't give her a direct answer immediately. I just Look, I just looked at her and shrugged. It was only much later when I got home that I remember what I had read. Read. You join the Inns of Court to read law, not study law. As a law student some half a century ago, the case of Dudley and Stevens. I think all law students or lawyers should know the case. We know, we know it is wrong to kill a human being for food in order to survive, although necessity is a defense to the charge of murder. I shall re uh, recount the saga of Dudley and Stevens from Lord Denning's What Next in the Law. This is what he said. I turn now to a case where a judge took away from a jury the right of giving a general verdict of not guilty. The crew of an English yacht, McNugnet, three men and a cabin boy, were cast away in a storm 1,600 miles from the Cape of Good Hope and were compelled to put off in an open boat. No water, no food, except two one-pound tins of turnips. After four days, they caught a turtle. After 12 days, they had nothing to eat. On the 12th day, on the 20th day, the three men decided for the sake of their families to kill the boy. They said a prayer, killed him, and fed on his body and blood. Beyond doubt, they would all have died if they had not killed the boy. As it was, four days later, they were sighted by the bark Montezuma. They were picked up almost dead. The Montezuma took them and their boat to Falmouth. On landing there, they immediately told the whale the whole story to the customs officers. The men thought they would be able to return home the same night. But no, they were arrested and charged with murder. They were kept in prison and brought before the magistrates. Counsel for the Treasury knew that his weakest case was against one of the three groups who had not actually agreed to participate in the murder. He asked the former bench to discharge Brooks so that he might be called to give evidence, and the bench complied. He asked 
for the other two, Dudley and Stephens, to be committed for trial for murder. The counsel asked for them to be let out on bail. He quoted the great criminal lawyer, Mr. Justice Stephen, where Steph Stephen says, homicide is also justifiable from the great universal principle of self-preservation, which prompts every man to save his own life, preferably to that of another, where one of them must inevitably perish. I asked, I asked Maria, the granddaughter of my wife's sister, who is living with me, is it wrong for these shipwrecked soldiers as sailors to kill and eat a shipmate so that, so that they might be able to survive? She replied, you don't kill and eat one's ship shipmates so that you can survive. I'd rather die than to do that. I asked, why do you think it is wrong? She answered, to know what is wrong or right is in a person's upbringing. We do not commit murder to survive. I agree with her, and so did Baron Huttleston below, which I relate the story below, and so did Lord Chief Justice Coleridge and the other judges of the Queen's Bench who sat with him. See further below. She is certainly in good company. Since necessity is the defense to the charge of murder, it is wrong for a judge to take away from a jury the right to give a verdict of guilty or not guilty. I shall now return to the story as told by Lord Denny. The two men were tried at the assizes at the Exeter. The judge was Mr. Baron Huddleston. Mr. Baron Huddleston took a course which had not been taken for nearly 100 years. He had formed a clear view that the men were guilty of murder. He directed the jury that it was murder and told them they would have to obey his direction. In, in this, he was wrong. It is the right of every jury to give a general verdict of guilty or not guilty. But he suggested to them that instead of finding the men guilty of murder, they could find a special verdict, that is, set out all the facts and ask the court of Queen's Bench to say whether it was murder or not. That is what the jury did. Mr. Baron Huddleston himself drew up a statement of the facts. That was his undoing. By so doing, that is, by asking the jury to find a special verdict, instead of leaving it to them to give a general verdict of guilty or not guilty, Beryl Hutterson had angered the general public. But what was so wrong that it made the people angry with the judge? It was wrong because the judge took away from a jury the right to give a general verdict of guilty or not guilty. David Pennick described in his book, Judges, so anxious was he, that is Baron Huddleston, to ensure the conviction of the defendants, and so concerned was he to deny the jury an opportunity to acquit them, that he persuaded the jury to adopt the unusual device of entering a special verdict, stating the facts of the case, concluding that as to whether these facts established the offence of murder, the jurors are ignorant, and leaving it to a court of peace bench to decide. Now I return to Dennings what what's next what what next in the law. The case was argued before Lord Chief Justice Coleridge and four other judges, including Mr. Baron Huddleston himself. They all held, held that the men were guilty of murder and sentenced them to death. Their finding was supported by all the elegance of, at the command of Lord Coleridge. But the eloquence was to no avail. It did not receive universal acclaim even to Victoria, even in Victorian England.